maybe if we start off by before discovering Product Muslim, before taking on the master classes, if you can describe what was life then, what were your main challenges, what were the things you're struggling with, what have you tried already before kind of joining the master class, you know, and becoming part of this group? I moved to the U.S. in 2012, and before that, you know, I went to med school initially in Nigeria and then in Ghana. And as I was transitioning between Nigeria and Ghana, I met these brothers who they would come to me and try to mentor me along the path of the dean so that I would be better connected to Islam, you know, to the masjid, to the Muslim community. And initially I felt just like they were almost like pestering me and just disturbing me with these things that in my upbringing, even though Islam was, you know, part of our identity, it didn't really transcend beyond making salah, you know, dressing up as Muslims. And then, you know, one of the reasons why I go by my first name and my Muslim name, you know, my middle name, which is Suleiman. My first name is Dalapo. Most people who grew up knowing me would probably know me as Dalapo. And then in the Muslim community, for those who grew up with me in the Muslim community, they would call me Suleiman. And that's kind of been both names that I've carried all along. So the reason I bring that up is sharing that initial struggle with my identity as a Muslim. So I really did not... I didn't really understand that being Muslim transcended, you know, those ritual practices and then carrying it over to how you relate with people beyond the walls of the masjid. Fast forward to when I got to Ghana, that continued to be a struggle. I was all by myself, this 16, 17 year old, first time leaving home really. And I kept being pulled by all these different forces, you know, the masjid, the nightclubs, the parties at the campus, you know, my lectures and all these forces. And I didn't really, I really never understood how to align them. Alhamdulillah, I leaned more towards going to the masjid and not really getting too deep into everything else. And then focusing on my academia, which was my priority over there as a foreign student. Fast forward to when I moved to the U.S., that struggle continued. I moved to the U.S. 2012, got into residency, I got married. And my wife seemed to be far further along in terms of her Muslim identity than I was, even though, you know, which was one of the things that attracted me to her, alhamdulillah. So there was this tension, you know, it continued really throughout my residency. It got better as I progressed through residency, alhamdulillah. I realized that I couldn't participate in some things, even though it kind of took me out of the circle, quote unquote, of the group of my class. My class was just six, six residents. I was, I was Muslim, I was black, I was a foreigner. <laughs> so- Welcome to the United States. Like, yeah, <laughs> so it was rough. But alhamdulillah, I was, I was able to manage it, mainly I think because I'm very connected to my parents and my dad. Both of them have instilled these strong values in us. And my focus was always to be the best in what I was doing. And then I finished residency as chief resident, alhamdulillah, even though I was a you know, minority, triple minority. And then I went to fellowship in Texas. I had been slowly reading about productive Muslim. And I think the first place I actually heard about this was from Mufti Menk. Oh, subhanAllah. Oh, and, my goodness. And I, think he was I should before. text him right now and tell him, dude. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Mufti Mank. <laughs> subhanAllah. Mufti Mank yeah. mentioned Abu Productive. He said, there's yeah. this guy, you know, he's yeah. been doing this thing. And I don't That's quite fine. recall when it was. If it was when I was in Ghana, I think, or maybe when I was a resident. But he was the first one. So I've been reading some articles and following mm -hmm. along. Then I took the leap when I was a fellow. I did a year of fellowship from family medicine to hospital medicine. I did a fellowship year in Texas, mm -hmm. West Texas. So one of the weekends you were doing the Baraka Effect workshop with Brother yes. Omar Uzma. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Talk about a workshop that changes people's lives. I, I honestly think that that was the place where I really locked into this idea of Baraka. Mm -hmm. Did you attend the Dallas workshop? 
I was there. Really? <laughs> I you, oh my gosh. I you, I you <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> oh, so, oh, wow. Okay, now it's getting deep. Okay, it's final. <laughs> this was in 2016. 16, I, or, yeah, 16. Yeah. And I just moved to the US a year ago. So, yeah, I was also fresh off the boat myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I was like, boy, this is what I've been looking for. And I think one of my biggest takeaways from that workshop was the abundance mindset. You know, you guys share the stories from the CRO that connects those ideas with what we do now and how we limit ourselves and this scarcity mindset and how it stops us from truly, you know, reaching our true potential and, you know, being fully invested in everything that we do and having the courage to take the leap. And I think for me, that was really a game changer. And uh, really from that point on, everything else was was game. Everything else that came was, I think the next big leap was the masterclass, the Productive Muslim Masterclass. And that, I think one of the biggest things that hit home with me was the idea of the self, the psycho-spiritual model of the self, the soul, the nafs, you know, these ideas, the blood, you know, the heart. And between that time and now that my understanding of that idea continues to evolve. You know, I recently read Sheikh Ahmed, uh, Mikhail Ahmed Smith's book with the heart in mind. And it was pr it's profound, you know, the impact that the heart has in everything that we do. And as a physician, it goes a really long way. One of the things that I do a lot of in my in, in practice as a hospitalist physician is you know a physician who takes care of sick patients in the hospital is that oftentimes I have to have tough, difficult conversations with patients and families about end of life. And there's no way that I can bring myself to have that conversation with good intention and sincerity without really considering their hearts in the conversation and bringing my heart into the conversation. So that was a really enlightening part of the Productive Muslim Masterclass. And one of the things you do really well is that you provide a very pragmatic framework for looking at things and, and then the tools to be able to, to work on getting those things done. So, you know, fast forward from the Productive Muslim Masterclass because I knew I needed an extra push. I went ahead and, and signed up for coaching. And that was another huge leg up for me. Uh, it came at a time when I was transitioning. So before I even go to that, something happened while I was in between, you know, the Productive Muslim Masterclass and then, you know, going into coaching which was I used to work, you know, this is finished fellowship residency. I was working two hours away from home. My wife was also in training in her residency. And the only place I could get a job because I was a uh, you know, foreign medical graduate, a decent job was in a small town about two hours away from where my wife was to her residency. So I had been there for about two years at this point and we had twin boys, alhamdulillah, and it became impossible for her to be there with three boys all by herself, me working. And my career trajectory was already taking a leap. I was you know, one of the leaders on the team. And actually I became the interim leader when my immediate superior uh, decided to resign from that position. So all these things were happening and then I had to make a decision. So how did I make that decision? I think, alhamdulillah, it was easy for me to make that decision to drop all that and focus on family, honestly, because my understanding of my priorities and my values has evolved significantly because of stuff that I've learned from, you know, the productive Muslim, from Abu Productive and, and the team. So, you know, I know that what's really important, you know, what's Allah SWT going to ask me about? Am I starting, to, you know, if I decide to stay there and get a nanny to be there, would that be fulfilling my role at home? You know, the answer was clear. It was difficult, you know, because alhamdulillah, I had a really good relationship with the people I was working with, the hospital community, 
that was the city where I also did my residency. So I had a lot of connections, not only in the Muslim community, but also in the larger uh, mainstream community, which seemed like this guy, something may be up, you know, he may be onto something in this town. Maybe he should just stick around. But, you know, after deep reflection, you know, the choice, the right choice was obvious. I dropped all of that, moved over to where I am now to the same city with my wife. And I credit that decision really to a lot of things that I've learned from the productive Muslim. And then within six months of getting here, here comes my immediate superior here saying that, look, I'm leaving. And I've seen your work, I've seen what you do. I think you're the next leader here. And I was like, what is going on here? And I'm like, I dropped all these things. And then six months, actually it was within three months or four months, that that conversation started. And then six months, it became like official, you are gonna be taken over. And then I think it was right at the year that I was here that I took over as the, the medical director, chief hospitalist for my group. And I've been in that role now for about a year and a half. It was right about a month before I took over the role that I started the coaching. Mm-hmm. So if you remember, you probably coached too many people to remember this, <laughs> but I was struggling with taking on that role. I was also serving as a board member in the new masjid in the Muslim community here. And then I had my three boys. My wife is also a physician and I didn't know how to manage these things. And that was the coaching really helped me to bring together all these things and to begin reset my priority and really understand what season of life that I was at and how to balance those things. Understand what my priorities are in the grand scheme of my responsibilities to my creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to my family, you know, to my community, to my, you know, the Muslim community and my work community, to bring my whole self to each of these roles and to focus on what some people call the long game an akhira focus of not just on trying to be the best at work while leaving all my responsibilities at home or in the Muslim community, which honestly, it's, you can do that. And people will see from the outside and feel like this guy is doing really well, but it's a short-term focus, you know what I'm saying? And it doesn't bring peace. There are also simple things that are quote unquote simple <laughs> that I've implemented like taking naps. You know, I have multiple meetings in between seeing patient care, including patient care, meetings with my colleagues, with meetings with hospital administration in this role, you know, talking to my wife in the course of the day. So things like taking naps definitely helps, even if it's a 10 minute nap. And even people who are not Muslim, who don't follow productive Muslim around me know. <laughs> it was so funny. They wanted to celebrate Halloween recently and they wanted me to put on this t-shirt. They made a t-shirt with nicknames for everybody. And they put mine, they put Sleepy on it. And I said, I'll take the t-shirt, but I'm not gonna be in that picture for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> I, so they know, you know. And awesome. one of the other things that I think I've realized about myself, which you had mentioned this, that how would people perceive you? once you started to implement some of these things. And I've noticed that I'm a lot more calm and a lot more tranquil in my approach to dealing with people. And I've realized that it's become infectious. You know, one of my yeah. colleagues in particular, I was, you know, giving them feedback and both of us almost went into tears during that session. Because yeah. one thing I try to do is when I give feedback, I ask for feedback and one of the things they said was, you know, subhanAllah, they, they thanked me for taking the time to prioritize, giving them that opportunity to share something that I've noticed and that we can all work together to improve upon for the sake of the team. And in particular it is the approach, which I have a feeling that that has to do with trying my best to communicate from the heart and being empath, empathetic that it could easily be me sitting on the other end of you know, my desk and receiving feedback. So how would I want the person sitting across the table to present this feedback? 
And this person said that in the past when they have received feedback, that you know, they'll just be like, you know, whatever, this person doesn't like me. But that this time they truly want to get better. And I think it's been a process of accumulation with these multiple master classes. You know, alhamdulillah, I did that last master class as well, which even went deeper on these concepts. One of the things my biggest take home from the advanced master class was truly spending time on reflective exercise on a consistent basis, you know, daily. I try to, even if it's just a blurb of five lines, I write down some of the key moments from my last 24 hours that I can learn from. You know, mistakes that I made, my possible wins, some crucial conversations that I had. And then the idea of spending time in nature and just pondering over the creation of Allah and how that brings peace. And then the idea of breathing. Breathing is something that I share with some of my colleagues who I know they struggle with sometimes settling with the idea of what's going on around us and stuff that we really don't have control over. And I use it as well. And so there's just so much that you've shared over the course of the years that has impacted me. I can't thank you guys enough. And I know I say this all the time, but I don't think you understand how much this has That's really awesome. affected me. And I, I would like to say that it's the the fact you've taken these stuff, I mean, again, we have hundreds of people that go through a master, alhamdulillah. And it's hearing stories, like I said, we say people actually take it hard, take it seriously, implement it, test, even though it's like, okay, it's weird, it's not comfortable, it's not, I take a nap, right? Like, you know that, you know you get backlash for that, but you still go ahead and take a nap, right? You know you yeah. get, get a looks like a, with this breathing guy going on here, but you still do the breathing. Like the fact you put yourself, I think there's, 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 there's a lot there. And I guess from that, so I love this trajectory the story from the from your Nigerian Ghana, and you had almost this sort of split personality of Dean is something ritualistic at home, nothing to do with life really, and then to now where it's integrated, right? It's like you feel like it's it's a holistic approach. Can you just talk about the transformation? Maybe how is that affecting how you view faith in general, spirituality, in work, all that stuff? Like just that transformation of character merges two sides together. Yeah, that's a profound question. I asked my wife on a couple of days ago, like I have this interview coming up. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> that's a good, I should ask, I should interview her maybe. <laughs> she, she, give, she would give like, this is what you did to my husband. <laughs> and she said, jokingly, you know, always mm -hmm. talking about the Barakah mindset, you know, you don't let us hear anything else. <laughs> and then she said, you know, you truly bring it into everything you do, especially in your decision-making paradigm. And, you know, as far as that's almost like a split personality that you talk about that I think I had compared to now, and it's still a journey. I don't think I'm really there yet, but I think, alhamdulillah, with all the things we've learned from you, you know, by, by the Tawfiq of Allah, that I've moved along on that trajectory. And, I think I'm able to bring my whole self to everywhere. And I think the place that it's probably one of the places that all of us struggle to bring it the most is, you know, the work environments. Um, one of the first conversations I have now when I get to a new position is my Juma, Juma time. You know, it so happens here that I'm supposed to have a meeting really the same time that I have Juma's going on. And I told them, I can have my component of that meeting earlier in the day or later in the day. I just can't have it at that time. If there's an emergency in patient care, of course, that takes precedence. I'm going to stay, take care of the patient. But if it's something that can wait, then, or that I can do earlier in the day, then I would rather do that. So I think it's helped me to be truly Muslim at work. And, you know, once I'm able to do that at work, really, I think in most other settings, I have a very simple life, either at home, at the masjid, at work, most of the time. You know, every now and then I'll hang out with friends, most of the time my friends are Muslim. If I'm going for a conference, you know, same thing. Yeah, when things come up that's not really aligned with my values, and my mindsets, it's easier for me to excuse myself from those things now than in the past and not feel too much regret. You know, knowing that I'm doing this for the sake of Allah, I'm trying to be in that state of 
the state of worship is not just performing the rituals. It's truly a state of being. And once, you know, as all of us aspire towards a state of truly being Muslim in every sphere, in every moment, then it's a more peaceful way to, to exist. You have more resilience, alhamdulillah, you know, by the will of Allah, to be able to deal with all the trials and tribulations of life. You know, it's just a healthier way to live and integrate our lives with our true identity as Muslims, as true slaves of Allah, and let that flourish in everything that we do, in every interaction that we have. There's just so many interactions that are just running through my head now where, or some quote unquote small decisions that I've made just because this is the mindsets that I've come to identify with, the Baraka mindsets instead of being that it impacts everything that we do. One thing I'll share, which I think if there's any physicians listening here is, mm. you know, when we bill, when we build clinical encounters, there's a risk if you're focused too much on material of overbilling. And there's a lot that physicians do that's really not very well clearly defined in their remuneration package. And so there's a risk of, you know, overbilling, and then yes, you'll get paid a lot more. Did you really put in that much effort? And then what are you doing to your chances of getting baraka in your income, in purifying your income? And then what are you going to say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment? You know, just those kind of thoughts that come into my mind because I've been exposed to these things. And I've been exposed to it from somebody who is not necessarily a scholar. You know, somebody that I can relate with is a professional. You know, he was in corporate world. Um, I think that also kind of changes the dynamic because oftentimes there is a like a gap between the scholar and the average Muslim. And I think one thing you've done very well is to try to bridge that gap. And it's a journey. It keeps getting, inshallah, we keep trying to integrate that the example of the Sahaba, that everything that they did was really driven by what the Rasulullah taught them. And they brought it to bear in everything that they did, not just in the masjid. So I think that's kind of a roundabout way of saying that mm. the transformation from that split personality. And like I said, anybody who knows me knows that I'm not there yet. It's a trajectory that I'm excited to be on. You know, alhamdulillah, my wife and I are on the same page for the most part on all these things. And and our kids, alhamdulillah, we're trying to raise them with these mindsets. You know, my wife and I talk a lot about, one of the projects that my sister has been working on is um, intentional Muslim parenting. Nice you know, parenting with the gardener's mindset. Oh, beautiful. You know, it's, I need to sign up for that. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's profound. It's profound. It's, alhamdulillah. I, I see my sons do stuff and my wife just looks at me and says, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> you know, he's, Alhamdulillah. he's seven years old now. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. If there's one word to summarize that transformation or the leap mm. is that what I learned from the productive Muslim gave me courage. You know, gave me the courage to take the leap and to leave the results to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be vulnerable that I'm going to make mistakes and that it's okay. And my wife and I, we sometimes we're really hard at each other and sometimes we're, we realize that, you know, come on, be merciful with yourself. If you're doing this well, you'll do better next time, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, one of the best journeys that I've ever had. And I think it's affected many, many aspects of my life. I'm hoping that, you know, Allah continues to put back in your work and that, uh, you know, I can be, you know, that Allah will use the people that have learned from you also to continue to spread the work, um, you know, in progressive ways, in ways that are completely aligned with our true purpose, you know, in this life, worshiping Allah. I mean, exactly. Khair. All I can say is Allah is trying to accept this from you and, and keep you steadfast, right? right? You know, I mean, keep you steadfast um, and keep you on this journey and beyond this journey. I feel like, you know, sometimes like our work we do, so like you said, we're, we're like post people. We just, we just live to one end and then we pass it on to the next, 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 next journey. And I feel like there's that moment where you almost like graduate from that journey and you sort of continue on to other things way, way beyond 
what is started. So I pray that this this continues to you with your family. Pray uh -huh. with your uh -huh. wife and kids, inshallah. Uh -huh. I know the time is almost up. Hamad, any thoughts, questions? I know you're someone who's as someone who's just seeing the first time, seeing a person who started, went through pretty much most of our programs. Question, thoughts, go for say man. That was an amazing story, Allah, uh, and I'm honored to have heard it from you and to be able to see you express your journey was, it helped me, <laughs> if I'm being completely honest, it, it, was, it was a great reminder for me, and I'm, I'm glad that you were able to do this, and may Allah, you know, continue your journey with, with your wife, with your kids, um, and with your job, and allow you to continue to grow, and, and allow us to continue to learn from you, inshallah. I don't have any questions, but if you if you ever have anything, if you ever need anything uh, from us, just feel free to contact us. Inshallah. Yeah, well, if I were to say, if there's is a gap, you feel like okay, I went through this journey, and maybe if you were to redo this journey, say rewind and redo it this way, would have done it differently? Is there another way we could have presented this stuff in terms of stages or planning? Like, what would make sense for someone who's like, let's say you have a younger brother, or someone who's like, okay, he's just start this. Would you take the same path? or something else is missing, a step before, step after, you feel like, yeah, maybe this part needs to be more elaborated, go deeper. You know what I told my wife, I said, the Productive Muslim Company team, they really put in a lot. They're very thoughtful. So it's very hard to find gaps in the work that they do. You know, I've been recommending the programs to as many people as I can. If I was to do it again, I may have started with the Productive Muslim Masterclass itself, in terms of my journey, I think I wish I heard more about this in the Masajid. I think it's especially for the, the Muppies, you know, as, as this generation of young Muslim professionals are called now, there's, a, there's still a huge proportion of people who haven't heard about these things. And many of them go to Juma, you know, very, very regularly, but they never hear about this. And I think many of the people I meet one of the things that worries me is, is that they're still at where I was before I found Productive Muslim, is that split personality. I think for lack of a better term is that there's a fear to take the leap. And I think the reason is there's not enough understanding of why that fear is. And for somebody to present it to them in a way that they can identify with, so that probably is one thing that I think is a gap. And in my community, I've been thinking about ways to bring, you know, your material to the people that I think need it. And I've, you know, I share it with them at times when I think they're going to be most receptive, like during Ramadan. And I'm hoping that I'm patient enough to wait for the transformation to come, to continue the reminders. If there is one thing, I think that, you know, you're in Dallas, most of the Muslims, communities in Dallas probably know about your work. But I, that's one thing that I think that there is a gap there now that I think about it is the vast majority of people who can benefit from it, they still get most of their education from the mainstream schools, which is great. But I think they need to also hear it from people like you who have been through that professional corporate world can relate and still staying connected to the corporate world, like, like with your work with Salesforce and Google and all these people. So, you know, I don't know if you're already doing work, partnering with Masajid and maybe training other people who can present your work mm -hmm. um, to take the work beyond what is going on now. You know, if I was gonna take the journey again, I think it will probably be very similar to what it is now, except that I wish that I had been connected to it in the masjid, which is where most people who are going to shift in their mindsets and be able to navigate the dichotomy of my role in the larger society versus being Muslim, I think that's where most of them are. It's interesting with the way you use the word fear and then the transformation with courage. So it's almost like, and, and you put it really well, like that, that fear, and that's it's true, you're right. I mean, I can remember myself in the corporate world, that fear of you know doing something physical about it, fear of telling your boss. Like I was talking to someone last week, a doctor also, and he's like just fearful of telling his colleagues he's going to pray, even though no one said anything. Just just literally fear. And it's like you can't get over. Like, why am I so scared? Like why don't I talk about it? 
and he was struggling with that concept. So in a fear and courage, I think it comes down to that. And where that, you know, Sukhav Shifan plays role, right? Stop putting that, you know, magnified, oh my God, if you do this and they're going to fire you or you're going to be out of the circles, you won't get promoted. And he puts all this fear, fear of poverty, fear of so-and-so, yeah. fear of loss. Yeah. And yeah. here we're teaching, we're teaching people courage, like the way, I mean, that's, yeah, courage about, you know, believing in the Baraka, believe there's actually something better, sacrifice, um, yeah. That's powerful. Yeah, I never thought of that perspective. That that really, really does resonate. And I just, you know, yeah, you brought back memories <laughs> of cover yeah. world and what that does to you as well. It's fine. It's fine. I'm conscious. I don't want to take too much of your time. I know you you have a hospital to run. So I say May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in all you do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this from you. Subhanakallah, bihamdik, ashadu la ilaha ilant, astaghfirka wa tubu alaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa